questions in the comment box. Feel free to ask anything and I will do my best to answer. This week has been a really interesting week as far as COVID-19 goes. Uh, certainly, we are, uh, I, I think many parts of the country are turning the corner. Many parts of the world are turning the corner. Um, before I go into some of the good news, though, I just want to preface it with that even though we're going to hear about some good news here, that we are still months and months and months away from, you know, any semblance of normalcy in that I don't even think we should be thinking that way anymore uh, because there is a new normal that is going to last for at least a year, probably two years uh, at minimum here. OK, and, and I'll explain and get into all of this. And by the way, I posted if you haven't listened to a podcast interview I just did, it's on um, Unlatched Mind. It should be in my Facebook feed. Take a look, uh, take a listen to it. I thought it was an excellent interview. The uh, interviewer asked great questions and we covered so much and definitely try and go to it and, and take a listen. It's an hour long of really, really good content. Most of it's still relevant today. And by the way, if you are interested in any other podcast, there's a podcast that I do called Conversations. You could just look it up, Conversation. I post them, uh, so you should find it. But the it started off with just uh, medical professionals, um, a few of my mentors, and it's expanded now into some really fascinating people. For example, we are going to launch tomorrow um, an interview with uh, Billy Goldberg, the author of Why Do Men Have Nipples? And the week after that, we're going to launch an episode uh, with Angie Povolitis, who was the prosecutor uh, the attorney who prosecuted Larry Nasser, uh, the uh, the physician who sexually assaulted and raped hundreds and hundreds of women in the U.S. gymnastic team and uh, Michigan State University. So we have a podcast with her, uh, hour and a half long, and we have a bunch of other really good ones that are done. So really exciting stuff. So please take a listen to that. Okay, back to COVID. All right, the we're definitely turning a corner here, and what we're what what's happening is that everyone who's been inside, and it's almost like a, I feel like I know I've been inside almost a month, and I'm sure many of you are have been inside almost that long or longer. Uh, that has an impact, right? And and we're seeing that impact. And I think I mentioned this last week, but there's a paradox to good public health, and the paradox is that when you do what you're supposed to do and you stay away from infection, the infection rates come down, right? That's why we do this. And uh, for anyone who's claiming it was about closing borders or you know some other moronic reason, uh, the reason why things are slowing down is because we are all physical distancing shelter in place for the last month okay that is why things are working and what i worry about next is uh people saying look it's not as bad as you made it out to be that is so dangerous and it's the classic response at this stage in a pandemic you have to ignore those responses please Trust me on this. You have to ignore that. This is not a two-month or four-month event. This is a two-year event, all right? And we'll talk about kind of what that means and, and what to expect on the third part of this. So the curve is flattening, and that means that people who would have died are going to probably get a little better care or people who are, I should, let me rephrase that. The sickest patients are going to get the care that uh, they need in most hospitals right now. They're still extremely busy and overwhelmed, uh, especially in the hot spots, Detroit, New York, New Orleans. But 
we're at least seeing a decline in cases. And not only are we seeing uh, the curve flattening, uh, but the people are really heeding the warning and staying home. So non-COVID cases are showing up less and less to the emergency department, which is allowing the hospitals to manage those COVID patients. So that's really great. Okay, so the, the curve is definitely... <laughs> We the cur thanks Salim. I, I just got a little personal message, man. Thank you. Uh, the curve is definitely starting to flatten. We're plateauing with cases at this moment, and that's really good. Okay. So what is what does that mean though? Does that mean that we're all going to be able to go out in two weeks? No. <laughs> as far as just you know, go back and 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 go back to our normal lives. The answer is absolutely not um here's here's the deal COVID-19 the virus that causes COVID-19 is endemic in our population it's still around us what we are avoiding right now or what we've been able to actively do is to slow down the rate of infection okay by doing that we've allowed our healthcare facilities to respond to this surge of cases now we're entering the next phase of this. How do we now go from shelter in place to maintain a rigorous surveillance system so that we could identify cases to limit spread, but to get back some semblance of life where uh, people could try and go back to work, we could start educating our kids again and go back outside. Uh, and 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 get a get things rolling. So that's going to be complicated, and it's going to take a lot of different discussions. And I could put out some ideas to you and what this is going to look like. And um, you know, there's no one answer here. There's not one thing. So, for example, people say, "Well, we should just test everyone." That is not going to solve this. Okay. First of all, there is no way we will be able to test anyone, everyone because we don't have the capacity to test everyone. We don't have the reagents. We don't have the laboratory uh, capacity to test everyone. So there is no way to do that, okay? Now we need to increase testing, absolutely. And there's diagnostic testing, right? Do you have COVID-19, yes or no? And then there is serological testing as well. Have you had COVID-19, yes or no? And are you now immune to it? All right, two different tests to give us two different types of information in very important ways. All right, it's the same thing with a vaccine. If a vaccine came out tomorrow, uh, it's going to be months and months, meaning if, if a vaccine was created tomorrow, it's going to be months and months before you could get to the level, the scalability of that vaccine to get out to everyone. All right. So here's the other thing that's really important here. That um, we, as we emerge from our shelter in place, as we go back into society, cases are going to rise again all right it is inevitable how what our federal government and state governments and local governments need to be doing right now and what our discussion needs to be instead of the bickering about who did what with ventilators we need to put a plan together on how we're going to emerge and what systems are gonna be in place so that if someone who shows up at the local food town or shop right or Kroger turns out to be positive, how do we rapidly identify that person or the people that they've been around and to isolate these people to keep the pocket of infection limited again? Because otherwise, what you're going to end up with is another sharp peak again, and we will all be sheltering in place, okay? Until 
we have a system that is organized, that is systematic and nationalized, we are going to go from peaks to uh, peak of infection being shelter in place to waiting a while, a month or so, going back outside, peak infection rates are going to come back. And then we're going to go through, we're going to cycle through this over and over again. And that is one way that we're going to do this. It's not an efficient way to do this. Uh, but uh, my guess is, given the uh, ineffectual leadership uh, right now at the highest levels, we will end up in that role. That's my thought here. Okay, what are some possible uh, or what are some good ways or some good options that we have uh, that uh, ideas? Okay, number one. We know that young people, younger people, teenagers, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, overall are being, are having lower morbidity and mortality than the, in the general population, which is a good thing to know, okay? So if you have a 20-year-old and an 80-year-old and they both get infected with COVID, right now it is much more likely that that 80 year old suffers pretty severe consequences and has a much higher mortality than a 20 year old healthy person all right now we need to identify a few things here number one it would be great to know who has been infected and if they have an immune immunity to covid and you do that through serological testing and there's a lot more information coming out about that but here's the deal. If anything, the next thing our society needs to do, if we can identify everyone, the people who need to get out are the young, healthy people. Now, that doesn't mean young with underlying comorbidities or disorders. You know, if you're young with asthma, that's concerning. If you're young with an autoimmune disease, that's also concerning. If you are young, and healthy if you go out there and whether you know ideally you would know your immunity but if you do get infected chances are you are going to recover uh without any significant um complications for every person that has recovered that is out in public you decrease the r naught and what does that mean you decrease the infectivity of COVID-19, all right? You act as a lightning rod. So if we have, for example, 10, 10 take 100 people and 100 people who have never been exposed to COVID-19 and you introduce one positive person to that group of 100 people, right? You are going to see probably 70 to 80%, 70 to 80 of those people ultimately eventually all of them will end up being infected if they're mingling with one another right and they'll be infected pretty quickly but if you have 50 people who have already been infected and 50 people who have been who are naive to the virus who have never seen the virus right it's going to take a much longer time to get those 50 naive people infected by the virus because the virus can't spread as effective efficiently to people who have not been infected because if you've been infected right that virus can't infect you again already let's presume that that's the case it's not a hundred percent but let's presume uh and so you're like a lightning rod you slow down the infection that another term for that is herd immunity and it's exactly why you know we vaccines work even though a hundred percent of people are not vaccinated uh, for the most part most most not all right of the vaccine preventive diseases um you rarely see them for the most part all right we have some issues here uh but for the most part so we need to establish herd immunity here in the united states for COVID-19. That is one way that we're going to slow down the infection and limit, reduce your odds of contracting the virus. 
And this is going to be especially useful uh, for, for young and middle-aged people. Uh, and I, I also for older people as well, because it will decrease the chances. I also think kind of what does this new normal look like? And we've touched on this so many times and I'll kind of speed through this a little, but it is, we are pretty, it's the new normal is we are likely all going to be wearing N95 masks uh, out in the public. Uh, we're going to have hand sanitizers everywhere. Uh, we're going to be spaced apart. Uh, six feet everywhere. That's not going to change. Okay. Uh, we'll be doing that for a long time. And when I mean long, probably a couple, probably a couple years. I just don't see people um, saying to themselves, well, I am going to, you know, I don't see a 70 year old or, an, or a 60 year old, or even myself. I don't feel comfortable going out into crowds right now. Uh, or flying on a packed airplane uh, without any personal protective equipment or um, a system in place uh, to prevent to prevent infection. So we could dive into some specifics there uh, in a minute. And I think that is an overall right I'm that covers kind of the the update for for this week I'm going to dive into questions get some questions going and then we could get specific uh, as far as areas that that you want to cover here and okay let me let me roll down here uh, <laughs> my parents are here Bree Shane good to see you uh, Miss Coplin great to see you uh, Megan Teresi or Therese, I finally know, I, I realized I didn't know your last name. Um, so now I know who you are here. So I am fearful of those people who think this is going to be done in May. Yeah, absolutely. This is a really, really important point. And I keep hard, I keep pounding on this. And if there's any takeaway from uh, for you guys here in this call, the one thing that you could get an advantage right now is this will not be done in May. All right. Yes, the shelter in place may be done in May, but COVID-19 will last easily for a year and probably longer than that, probably two years. There's no way to actually know. Uh, it will determine on what will determine how long it lasts is when you have an effective vaccine that is provided to um, the population uh, or when we reach a herd immunity. It is now here's the sad thing, and and here's what oh I I had someone was you know I, I hear this all that I'm hearing this more and more like oh we're at twenty four thousand deaths and by the way each one of those deaths has a mom or dad or a kid or a brother or a sister or a friend those are those are our our people and we throw around statistics and it's really important to remember that every one of those numbers is is a real person. And I want you to though think about this and this, the reality of this. 50% of the United States will become infected with COVID-19, okay? That is almost guaranteed, almost. Uh, you're gonna, we're gonna see 50%, 40% infectivity at least, okay? And if you run the numbers with a one or 2% mortality rate of all people, that 20,000, we're gonna wish it was only 20,000. And right, just you could do those numbers, but multiply 1%, you know, by 150 million, multiply 2% by 150 million. And uh, that's, those are the numbers we're looking at. So I've had two conversations already with people saying, oh, it's only 24,000 influenza killed you know, they had cited 80,000. I told them actually CDC had 30,000 last year or, you know, whatever the CDC said, that's the number I'll go with. Uh, you know, that it's less than influenza. Like this isn't as bad as you thought it was. That they are, they couldn't be more wrong, okay? Unfortunately, and this is really foreboding news, but when this thing is all said and done, the mortality and the numbers of people, human beings, friends, loved ones, teachers, doctors, garbage men, 
whomever, business people, it's going to be in probably the hundreds of thousands. Low, you know, hopefully as low as possible. Uh, but that's where we're going to go here. So um, please understand that this is the um, this is just the beginning. And I, you know, there's a quote that I, I, Winston Churchill says it. Michael Osterholm has been saying it, and I really like it. And it goes something like this: This is not the end. This is not even the beginning of the end. Perhaps it is the end of the beginning. Okay. And this is the first or second inning of a nine inning game here. Okay. Um, and so the more you could prepare for the long term, the better you'll be now. All right. Uh, Christine and a lot of our Governor Cuomo. Um, all right. Sarah Oliver. Uh, are we kind of out of the mitigation phase? Uh, no. Um, well, where we are, there will be more mitigation phases, and but we, we're at kind of the plateau, it appears, right? We're plateauing. Now, if we screw this up, right, you could get a curve that looks like this. So we're at the kind of looks like we're, we're, we're at this top here, and we could easily pivot right back up if we get this wrong okay so um and we'll likely end up mitigating again uh down the line thank you christine about shutting off homeland it was a really good episode though this week <laughs> that's right randy west food town circa 1980 i didn't know if anyone knew who food town was they don't have food town out here in the midwest but it was always my favorite shopping center all right uh let's see here uh, my cousin Merrill, do you have confidence from what you hear from professionals that the government will understand the need to wait an appropriate amount of time before opening the economy? Do you think we'll be rushed back and be back where we started? So we cannot shelter in place for 18 months or 24 months. We cannot do that. And I hope everyone on this call, regardless, uh, right, don't like let's uh, let's let's do our best to avoid the politicization of this and take the tact and take the position of, we know that we need to do everything we can to reduce the infectivity, to, to physically distance. And right now that was by sheltering in place. But we also know that our society is going to suffer greatly if we do not get back out and get business started again, get people educating, educated again, and get things running. You have to do that. And you have to do that for so many reasons. If you want enough reagents to test uh, people for COVID-19, you need people working making those reagents, right? If you want food delivery to your house, if you want food in the food stores, you need people out farming, delivering, right? You have to have these basic essentials. You need an economy. You need things moving. I think you get the point there. But they're not mutually exclusive, okay? And what I don't hear from the federal government or really any government, no, even states, maybe yesterday there was a few things, there's no plan to move forward, right? People will say, oh, we need to get things started. We need to shelter in place and we're going to end the shelter in place, but there's no plan to move forward. No one's putting anything in place, and that's what's dangerous. And that is what ultimately, yes, is going to probably lead to uh, some higher infectivity than we could have had. I think people, for the most part, are doing a really, are being very responsible. I know there's pictures of you know, of, of the spring breakers and still people, you know, doing things. And, you know, that's unfortunate. When 80% of the people do the right thing here, though, it things work, okay? In pandemics, if 70 or 80% of the people do the right thing, then um, we're on the right track there and, and things should do well. Uh, but no plan is going to be... Uh, the thing that really hurts hurts us here. 
Uh, Sarah Behoff Oliver, serological, the antibody test. Yeah, so serology essentially is looking in someone's blood and seeing do they have antibodies to the virus. And they may use some component in the test, a uh, certain component of the virus to see the response. Think about it as two magnets, okay, right? Um, your body has antibodies, that's magnet A. Uh, and COVID-19 ha it, it, it has a receptor um, to that antibody or the antibody attacks it. And think about two magnets sticking. And if, if you could, you could, you, if you really measure the strength of those magnets sticking together. Think about that as like your immune response. That's a very simplified version of this, but you could conceptualize it in your mind. So for people who have serological, who, who are serological positive for uh, antibodies, meaning they have a strong response to it, they are pretty, they are going to be immune as far as we know uh, right now, but that could change. Um, so yeah, Becca Swanson, just same thing about opening up America. America has to open up. The world has to open up. Okay. That is for sure, but it needs to be done in a coordinated and, uh, responsible way. I think we could all agree on that, uh, with leadership done. So, uh, Linda, uh, Linda, uh, you are being so diplomatic regarding the shit show in the white house. It is a shit show. Uh, since we have no national testing response, looks like we'll be in lockdown again in the future. Testing is, so testing is just part of the answer here. It's not the full answer. Um, yes, it's always great to know who who's infected. It's also even better to know who has been infected. And those things are are happening slowly in hospital systems. It, it, it was a shit show. Um, but uh, it's, it's, um, we, we, we need to, we can't shelter in place uh, forever here. I think we are all reaching a point where the, the curve is, we're going to cross the curve, the point in the curve that it's going to be safe to start venturing out with responsible behaviors. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> Lorraine uh, Litau, uh, just got food delivery, seniors here. I know your son uh, received cut cantaloupe instead of whole. I know pieces should be washed in cold water, but here in South Florida, water out of the tap is tepid. Should I soak in ice water? Uh, unless it has better flavor, I think you're probably fine. Even cut cantaloupe, you know, there's no evidence that COVID-19 lives on food right now. I think the risk, so if you if you're, if you want to be uh, vigilant, hyper vigilant here, which is, you know, if if I were uh, 60, 70, 80 years old or above, I would probably be feeling the same way. You could just rinse that off uh, with some water. Temperature doesn't matter. Use cold water. That's totally fine. Uh, it's the volume of water. It's the velocity of water, right, that hits things. So when you're cleaning a wound, Right. You could use regular water, tap water. As long as you have enough volume of water going over that wound, it will wash out all the debris. That's the same thing uh, with viral particles. Uh, Sharon, what do you think travel will look like once they start opening things back up? Would you travel in upcoming months? Uh, the last part of that is easy. No, I will not travel on a plane in the near future. Um, I, I would con I would consider it if I had an N95 mask I would I would consider it, um, but if I was sitting right next so it, it, you know I think so what does future air travel look like well at least for the next year or two I would I think they should remove middle seats. Um, there should be no one within a foot or two feet from you for sure. Uh, it would be great for them to stagger people in rows. I think this is the responsibility of the airlines. Um, if there is a enough supply of N95 masks, I think airlines should give out N95 masks. They should spend the money and buy them as long as our healthcare professionals have the masks that they need. Um, airlines should hand out N95 masks just like uh, you know, it should be at the seat back and everyone should be, re be required to wear one. I think that would be great. Um, and you know, how you board Delta just announced that they're boarding from the back front. And I can't believe they said first class could still board whenever that's, 
I, I can't believe this in the time of a pandemic that people care that much. Um, you, you board in a safe way. That's, that's what you do. So that's my take on air travel. Um, but if I were a 20 year old, 30 year old, healthy person, um, if I had a mask, I would, I would definitely travel. I'd have no problems with that. Uh, without a mask, if I were young and healthy, I may travel. Um, I'm not condoning that. I'm not, I'm not encouraging it. Uh, but there's, there's some good travel deals out there right now. So you may want to take advantage of them, but you have to be super smart, uh, if you do it right. Obviously, uh, if you had symptoms, you, you shouldn't leave your house, uh, just physical distancing and good, good hygiene. Okay. Uh, Shannon love that my girl has you. Thanks, Adam. Oh, you bet. Um, Christy Connie. Uh, do masks that aren't N95 provide any protection since we know how difficult N95 masks are to get and they still need to be at hospitals? What do you suggest? So N95 masks are, you know, look, I'm not a mask expert here and I can only tell you what I've read, what I've learned, what I've dug into this. And as far as I know, N95 masks, masks are the only ones that, that work. And the reason why, and not just an N95 masks, a proper fitting N95 mask, right? It needs to be sealed around your nose and your mouth so that there's almost a vacuum that's created so that when you're sucking, breathing air, the air is being filtered through uh, the matrix of the mask, uh, or even there's a little respirator on some of them as well. And so it will filter out any viral particles. So that's how an N95 mask go. Even an N95 mask that's improper fitting will expose you to particles as you breathe in air, the virus particles come in. Remember, these things are so tiny and not only are they in droplets, but they're aerosolized as well. And that means just me talking right now, if um, if whatever is whatever infective agent would be in me, uh, I would be spewing that out right now as well. Okay, so what do you do? here you know is is nothing is something better than nothing maybe i mean i just don't know enough it's not the answer right scarves are not the answer surgical you know cotton masks are not the answer are they protective i i think they're more preventive than they are protective meaning if you have one and you're able to and and you're speaking it's probably limiting the aerosolization of the virus. But then again, it, it's probably just coming out of the side of the mask. So I think there could be an incremental value to it, but definitely not a significant value. If you don't have a mask, I think you have to limit where you're going close to people, right? If you're always six feet apart, you should be fine walking around a neighborhood and things like that. Even going to the grocery store, you're probably okay. Uh, but if you're going to be in a situation where you may end up getting closer to people, like if you were caring for people and you, you had to do it, you know, maybe you're caring for some type of, uh, you know, uh, medical care or something, uh, you, you a mask, I, I would say, wait till you have a mask. Um, okay, Christine, did I do a good job on that one? Okay, and Becca, you say we will need N95 masks, hand sanitizer for a long time, years perhaps, for hospital, right. Um, <laughs> so Becca Swanson, yeah, hopefully the supply chain is also is the critical part here. And that is why we need people to get back out and work. Uh, but right. But if you just heard that, make sure you understand that with the responsible, with a plan, it's not just go out and work. OK, but you need the supply chain uh, to start cranking right now. You need reagents for testing. You need material for masks. You need um um alcohol and bottles for sanitizer we need all those things so the people who can get out and work if they've been proven to be infected or they're young and healthy we need those people to get out there and start getting the supply chain going supply chains imagine the biggest aircraft carrier in the world right uh, and multiply that by 10 times and you ask that thing to turn around and do a 180. That's what supply chains are like. You can't just turn them on and off. Once a supply chain is broken, it takes months to get it back going. And 
that's why it's it's important that we're focused on on making sure that we keep them uh, keep them flowing going and, and if they if they're broken that we work hard to get them back uh, so Danielle McGuire sports kids sports any way to do that with distancing I as much as I am trying to see a path for kids sports, I think I commented on this last time. I think it's going to be a case by case basis as far as communities go. So if you're in New York City, if you're in Detroit, if you're in New Orleans, if you're in any hot spot right now, there's no way I see sports happening in the next couple months. I mean, I just can't see that happening uh, because your kids are asymptomatic carriers. And, and then you're just going to get exposed, right? You're 40 year old or 50 year old or a 60 year old grandparent or whomever you're, you're going to be exposed. I don't see that happening. However, if you're on a, you know, golf club in Montana, yeah, I think you could probably get out and do your sporting event or, you know, if you're a go-carter in rural Minnesota, uh, you could probably do that. Now, Here's another really important point, okay? Every single county in the United States of America will be affected by COVID-19 when this thing's, by the time this thing's done. Every single county. There will not be a county that does not have one person infected here. That's how pandemics work, okay? It's a respiratory virus. It will be everywhere okay and so just keep that in mind kids sports is really hard right because we all want right we, we want our kids to be able to play and we want to watch our kids um it, it's uh i think we're going to be places that do it and you're going to have consequences from that right you will have people infected when you have if you start kids sports again uh, you will absolutely have people infected from that. Uh, but are there things you could do? I think these are the discussions that we need to have, right? These are the healthy discussions. You do it with public health. You do it with your local community. And you do it in a smart and organized way. Uh, Jerry, the paper masks, are they meant for one-time use only? I, I would never wear one. So, um, you know... Uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably rewear paper masks. Uh, okay, Salim heard this the other day. We should reframe social distancing, and instead think of it as physical distancing and social connectedness. Yeah, absolutely, right. The whole idea was physical distancing uh, from the start here, and uh, that's a great way to put it. Uh, Cousin Jake, any idea when people will be able to return to school? I think that's a question that all of us have. I, I don't see it happen. I don't see a path forward in places that have known high infection rates. Uh, I just don't see that happening. Um, I, I think it's going to be case by case, though, right? States are going to decide this on their own, and then families are going to have to make personal decisions as far as how to do this, okay? this is These are hard discussions. There's no right answer right now um, other than to know these, that this is – this is long term, and these are some of the things that we're going to be dealing with, as, as you guys all know. Uh, Daniel McGuire, what about studies in South Korea that show reinfection rate after surviving COVID 19? Yeah. So, right, a couple things about South Korea and some of the Asian countries and reinfectivity. Yeah. So, people who have been infected with COVID, there is some study, some evidence out there that e either they're, they're testing positive again, but even though you test positive, you may not be symptomatic. So it's not that these patients are clinically ill or, or anything may be wrong with them, but they're still carrying the virus. So that's one scenario, and that's, that's certainly concerning. Whether you're contagious or not is another question as well, right? A lot of these, you can't just look at this superficially, right? Maybe the test that they initially had was false. Maybe it was a bad reading, and now you're getting to see a real uh, answer to that test. The studies are just so small that you, it's hard to make conclusions uh, on that. Traditional virology says if you mount a strong immune response, you should be immune to the virus. Uh, that's what we're. That's what I think we're going on right now, and and hopefully that that is the case. All right. I I don't think we need to worry about the idea of not being immune right now until we get more information, and we're going to keep getting more information. 
So once infected with COVID-19, Kristen Gargano, can it live in our bodies and potentially cause the virus to become active again? Yeah, I think we're learning more and more about it. Um, just like, you know, people thought they knew what HIV was in the 1980s. It was, you know, they're like, oh, this is, I, I, they thought it was an HTLV virus, you know, infecting T lymphocytes. And, you know, then they finally realized, you know, they're wrong. And then they found it was a different cell, it was a CD4 cell. And, uh, you, you know, these things are gonna change. This is gonna evolve for sure. We don't know everything we need to know about it, uh, but we will find out. Um, the scientists are going to, find out a lot about COVID-19 and, and you will then know a lot about it. You know, this is not too dissimilar to what happened in the 1980s with HIV. If you want to watch a really, really amazing movie, it's called And the Band Played On. Uh, it's also a wonderful, wonderful book. It's my favorite. In fact, that book, it was actually the movie. It was with Matthew Modine. That movie is what got me interested in infectious disease and public health. It was that movie. And then the book is just like, whoo, it, uh, it is incredible. Uh, HIV had an incredible scientific movement behind it. And it was also plagued by political influence in that, right? There was a discrimination against homosexuality at the time. And because that's where this started and where it was being transmitted, that uh, there was lack of funding. No one wanted to put a name on it. It was shameful. Uh, and there's some, a lot of similarities here of how this, of how COVID-19 started out in January and February about this, but, and the plan and the band played on, take a watch that you'll love it. Okay. Phyllis St. Michael, how you doing? Do you recommend that we find out if we have an immunity to the virus? Wouldn't that be helpful to know? Yes, that will absolutely be helpful. We should all find out if we have an immunity to the virus. However, we do not have the capability of doing that right now. When we do have the capability, we should uh, respectfully form lines <laughs> and wait in that line and get the test done. And we find out what our immune response is. Once our communities have a plan for that, we should all participate in that. The more data, the better, but this is not going to be something that you're doing in two weeks from now, or probably even two months from now. There are too many challenges to do widespread serological testing just from the fact that you need reagents, you need labs, you need people doing all of these things. There are things that we need to do. When we're gonna do them is another question, okay? Uh, Cousin Merrill, is there concern that the virus will mutate thereby making vaccines and effective treatments more difficult? Yeah, these virus will absolutely mutate. There's no question about that. You may end up with a vaccine every year. Um, maybe not, you know, I don't know enough about the actual virology of this specific strain of whether the RNA bases are changing enough that a single vaccine um, can and won't or will work. There are people out there that are looking to do single viral vaccines. So can we find, is there a common denominator among all of these viruses, right? Because they, they pretty much all act the same. They're all in capsids, right? Imagine, imagine like a, um, a container and it's just their DNA or RNA is in that container. And that, that little container comes up to one of our cells and it makes a connection and then it inserts the DNA into our cell basically. And then our cell replicates, our own cells replicate the, that DNA and then the cell bursts and then all these new viral particles are out wreaking havoc on our body. That's 80% of what a virus does. <laughs> Simple life. And so um, uh, that's, uh, sorry, I lost the question here. Yeah, so mutations or antigenic drift or antigenic shift could affect us. Now, just think about this. Influenza, right, was introduced into the human population at some point, hundreds, thousands of years ago, whenever it was. Some years we have bad influenza. Some years we have devastating influenza, killing hundreds of millions of people relatively, right, in today's numbers back in 1918. Um, and some years we have light influenza. It's the same thing. This is now what we're gonna be dealing with COVID. 
uh, influenza of 1918 was bad. And that's mostly due to anagenic drift or anagenic shift where the, the RNA uh, in the virus in, or DNA, in this case it's RNA, will change. And, some, and, and it may change in an animal. It may change in a pig. So for all those conspiracy theorists who think that this was a man-made virus uh, out of some Wuhan lab, uh, just read a basic chapter, virology chapter on antigenic drift and shift, and you'll understand how these things move from animals to humans, okay? And um, this is what influenza does. This is what the uh, bad influenza or bad, you know, virulent strains of influenza has done. And COVID-19 is going to be the same thing. Stephen Leventhal. How could we safely get the kids back into schools? I don't think it's realistic for teachers to enforce social distancing in classroom or physical distancing in classrooms. That is correct. It's going to be a challenge. We need to talk about it. It's going to be case by case, uh, you know, depending on probably what your infection rates are in, in the city that you're living. Um, and, you know, it, it's going it's going to take a good discussion. Okay. I don't have an answer right now. There's ideas, but no answer. Uh, Salim, regular masks prevent spread of viral droplets. N95 uh, masks prevent from inhaling viral droplets. Yeah, exactly. So, right, is something's probably better than nothing as far as wearing a mask for your for you infecting someone else. As far as you being infected from wearing a mask, N95 is really going to be the only way to go. High five, Felice Shirash, my sister. Um, what about K N95, K95 masks we are buying yet? K95s are just the Chinese version of it. If you could trust it, then it's fine. Becca Swanson, you had mentioned in another live feed that it was possible that some of us could have had this earlier this year. If we think it was possible, is there any chance we could get tested? I commented on the testing already. You probably weren't infected. Uh, the more and more, uh, you know, when I, I'm looking at, right, you look at genomic analysis, and it probably wasn't here in December or January. It probably actually did come in February uh, to the United States. So, uh, Megan, how you doing? Uh, how long would the droplets remain in, in the air if I were to take a walk down the street? So, I think being outside is really important. Um, the wind will is a good uh a good way to spread out and dilute the particles, the viral droplets, UV light supposedly uh, may impact viral droplets. Look, you know, if someone's hacking in front of you, like walk away from them, okay? I don't think we're at the state where, you know, you're jogging and someone jogged past that same area five minutes ago. Is it, it's theoretically possible, absolutely, that you could get infected from that. I think practically speaking, use common sense, right? Don't jog right behind someone, five feet behind someone. It's better to be on the side of someone if you're jogging, all right? Because when you're breathing heavy and you're you know, coughing and jogging, you are releasing probably droplets and aerosolizing the virus. So side-by-side -side jogging is good. And, um, but if you're just walking around the block, like, you know, you don't have to try and avoid a smog or anything like that. Like you're not going to, there's not going to be there. Okay. Okay. Um, kids sport. Uh, say, yeah, yeah, that's a problem. Okay. I'm, I'm going down daycares. How will daycares operate? You know, the good news about this is, so if you have a daycare, you're probably uh, a young parent. Um, and you're right. Hopefully, you know, you may be in your twenties, you may be in your thirties and you would be relatively healthy. So I think daycare is going to be interesting, but the day, the people in the daycare may be older. Look, the same rules apply everywhere, whether it's a school, whether it's a, a plane, whether it's a sporting event, right? Uh, you know, you, you, we, we need to socially distance and, and use the same good hygiene and, how we do this, we need a plan on how we're going to do these things. And part of that is knowing who has been infected, who has immunity to this, if, if that is the case, and we think it is, right? So there's, there's various components to this. We need a plan. And uh, we know the parts of the plan. Now we just need to institute this, to, to, to execute on this plan. And this is where... 
uh, local local leaders are going to help make decisions. Local public health authorities are going to make decisions uh, because there's no plan coming out of our federal government. And it, it's, you know, every state is different. Every area is different on one hand in that the concentration of infections um, is different. But ultimately, every single county in America will be infected. All right, Jim Downs, welcome. I think this is your first time on this you are great but and the band played on blamed individual behavior uh also it was patients who worked first as activists then the scientific community picked up the lead rick mckay's book on patient zero is better for a film uh normal heart is better thanks for framing this around flu yeah so there's there's no question that yeah and the band played on you know uh flawed but i think in I think it, it it was a interesting book that brought out important points for the discussion. But we know um, that I still think it's worth everyone. I still think it's worth seeing that uh, because there's there's some good things uh, to look back on about that. Uh, not good meaning um, awareness awareness of the issues that were happening. Uh, and, and that film was made in the 90s. So there's a lot of inherent flaws uh, in that as well. Uh, but your uh, references are um, are valuable. Thank you. Uh, Maude Flager, how you doing? I haven't seen you in a long time. Glad you're doing well here. So in your opinion, how much would the curve need to flatten before things can open up again? And will that ensure that we don't have a second surge? So I touched on this at the very beginning. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna gloss over this. If you want the answer, just go back to the very beginning and listen to this. Uh, real quick though, just to give you a little idea, the curve is flattening, which is, a, which is great. And we will not be able to ensure, probably not that, you know, uh, this there there will be continuous exposures and infections here. Whether that second surge will be greater than the first, we just don't know. It depends on uh, our behaviors in various areas. Uh, shout out to all the Wisconsin people watching. Kristen Gargano, what's your thoughts on uh, uh, it's I ivermectin? Uh, <laughs> well, if you had scabies in COVID, ivermectin. It might work or cutaneous larva migraines ivermectin might work uh, but i don't think it's a, a covid treatment um it might uh all right jim downs gotcha makes sense thanks yeah absolutely by the way guys look up jim downs he is an incredible historian and uh, i am out of my league talking anything history uh with jim downs uh but he is exceptional so you follow him on twitter he has not only is he a sharp and intelligent and witty historian, but he's funny as hell. So uh, hopefully, hopefully I didn't do any misjustice there, Jim. Okay. <laughs> All right, Kristen Gargano. Now, do you think that the saliva-based test that just got approved will be a game changer in terms of testing since this can be done at home? Yeah, something like that would be a game changer if it was effective and if the... Um, you know, and if it was it, it and if it had a, a good variables as far as sensitivity and specificity, right? And the error rates weren't low. Um, but anytime, you know, any state, any test like that is going to be uh, probably highly sensitive, uh, meaning it's going to pick up more people, right? There, there'll be greater, hopefully, those there's greater uh, positive rates, right? False positive rates, and then you would have to get a confirmatory test. Um, and all of that is, there's still so many complexities to this, but yes, it would be a game changer. Uh, better movie late for dinner. It's a good movie for sure. Beth Brown. <laughs> okay. Uh, Brian Gargano, given the distrust in the Chinese data and studies, where are we getting our clinical data from in order to make informed decisions? Well, I think right now in the United States, we could get good data. Italy, we could get good data. Um, South Korea could get good data. There's a lot of good data now. The Chinese just had the first data. And, you know, there's a lot of problems with, with 
what the Chinese are letting giving us, but there's a lot of really great work going on there. There are real scientists who have sacrificed their life. Uh, we know two of them. Uh, there are scientists who have put their lives, who are continuing to put their lives at risk. And um, so, you know, take away the political component of 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 the Chinese response here, there are mistakes that were made, but gosh, for a month and a half in the United States, we had zero response. So, what kind of fault do we have? What kind of responsibility and accountability do we have here in the United States? You know, um, we 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 probably learn more from China's response than are harmed by China's response. Yeah, I don't think you can make an argument that they could have contained this virus. You know, it takes one person to leave Wuhan and your pandemic starts. So mistakes were made, but a lot of what you're hearing is politicized. Yeah, they could have done better. Absolutely. But you know who else could have done better? We look in the mirror and we could have done better here in the United States. I'm not talking individually, anyone here. <laughs> uh, of course not, right? Uh, but our institution, um, it was a complete failure. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Jim Downs. Uh, I'm absolutely out of my league. Okay. Uh, so Ahmad Flager, do you see wearing masks as a new normal? Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. My dad. Thought they said the saliva test was not for home use and also if tested negative needed to retest for it. Yeah, guys, here's the deal with testing. Ignore it. Ignore anything you hear on, on, uh, don't ignore it. It's never good to ignore as, as opposed to make sure you just uh, uh, ask questions about it and analyze it, right, in the proper way testing there's no tests coming to your doorstep okay just just like those checks aren't here yet from the federal government uh tests may be even longer uh you may have even a longer time waiting on those there are so many complexities to making these tests all right they're not like sheets of paper that you're going to just like get reams of and distribute uh, these are complex things that require uh that require oversight they require uh they need to be standardized they need reagents um you will not have a test you will not have a test in april and you probably won't have one in may is my guess okay i hope i'm wrong on that i hope i'm wrong Okay, uh, Phyllis St. Michael, due to large number of employees being found positive for COVID-19, meat plants and are being shut down, and would it be okay to still purchase and consume meat from those plants? Yes, I would still purchase them. That's personal. Um, I'm not giving you advice other than to tell you what I would do, and then you can make your own judgment. Uh, COVID-19 doesn't spread by food, at least what we believe. And so, yeah, I'd be fine with that. The greater risk is the supply chain in that you're not going to be able to buy pork and beef. <laughs> so you won't, maybe you won't even have to make that decision because there won't be pork and beef in the store. Okay, and, and that's a real worry. Uh, Brian Gerg, even though we're, we're past this surge, uh, the, the supply chains are, will get, you know, it's like this, right? Imagine you have 100 trains that are on a track and they're going somewhere and those hundred trains are all delivering things and 50 trains get by and then after the 50th train the tracks something happens to the track they could no longer the trains could no longer traverse the tracks okay so for the next month those first 50 trains that made it across are delivering their food mile a month goes by and those 50 trains that got trapped they still can't make it across the tracks okay so for that month you you're still getting your food your deliveries everything is looking great what's the problem no problems uh, but then all of a sudden the supply runs out and you need to fix the track 
And eventually another month goes by and you fix the track. And then finally, those 50 trains have to start their engines. They have to get, you know, whatever it takes to start their engines. They have to check their loads. Their loads may have expired, whatever. And then they need to get to the place that they're going. Supply chains don't just start and stop. They take a long, long time uh, to get going. All right, I got some good questions coming here. I'm excited. Okay, Dana Green Witter, are there any issues with rushing a vaccine? Um, yes and no. Like if there was one developed a year or so, will we find out in 10 to 20 years that it is a dangerous vaccine? Uh, yeah, you know, I always say don't be the first and don't be the last. Don't be the first, don't be the last. Be somewhere in the middle to get a new medication or vaccine. Uh, yeah, certainly if you rush a vaccine or not even rushed, right? There are medications and things that uh, we just, it's not done purposefully, right? It's just that the data is not out yet. And this is why you can't study 10 patients for a drug and claim that something works or not. Uh, vaccines are the same way. The way science works is you do something, you collect data and you keep testing it, keep challenging it and stressing it and trying to prove it to be wrong. Science is about proving things wrong, okay? And that's how we know that things are right if you can't prove it wrong. Um, so, yeah, okay. Salim, in regard to SARS-CoV-2 in the air. All right, good. In one publication, viable SARS-CoV-2 was detectable via aerosol and inanimate objects. Aerosols for about three hours post-aerosolization. Copper, four hours. So, you guys, I'll refer you to this comment here uh, by Salim. He posts the actual times on there. So ju I just want to add one caveat here, and then he posts a link. I want to add one caveat. Just because we, right, and this is what's important about interpreting data and science, just because a virus is on an inanimate object, a piece of copper, or steel, or countertop, that study is proving that that virus is there. It's not proving that it's leading to infection. Now, it may lead to infection, right? I'm not saying one way or the other. I just want to put uh, to make sure that we question uh, what the data is that we're looking at. The point is that, yes, it's there, it's living. What does it do after that? We don't know. Maybe, right? Let me just throw out just to right the whole idea of proving things wrong. Maybe when that virus is sitting on copper, maybe there's something in that copper that alters the binding receptor for that viral particle and it can no longer infect humans. It could test positive on that copper, but it can't infect humans. Just throwing it out there, right? And that's why you would have to actually test, does it go from copper to humans and cause an infection, all right? But the point is, one point is, that yes, it is on inanimate objects, it can be aerosolized in the air and we have to be super careful. And I think it's about your risk tolerance. Me, I am not wearing a mask when I go outside to jog or walk around. I am just gonna be you know, mindful of, of what's around me and, and do my best. That Those are the risks. Now, if I were an 80 year old person or a high risk person, I would probably alter my behaviors based on my risk tolerance, okay? Daniel McGuire, it is human behavior too. If you are a poultry worker and some colleagues are sick or they die, you probably start thinking you don't want to work there. Absolutely not. Um, the supply chains are gonna break down for various reasons. And this is what happens. So these are the fear of pandemics is that it's not just the virus itself that wreaks havoc, havoc. It's the impact on humanity, on humans, our psychology, the impact on our systems. And if you don't have people to keep the water clean or run the electricity or keep the gas going, those are real concerns. And right, those things lead to secondary and tertiary effects. You don't have some, you don't have clean water in a community. We already have seen that happen here in Michigan. Uh, you, you can't have, you know, you have a police force or a fire department that can't respond appropriately. You get secondary effects. You get food stores. 
that don't have enough food and people get hungry, right? There, you could, this has deep, deep, deep impact. And so flattening the curve was the first step. First step. We we have a long way to go. First thing over, guys, right? We, we're flattening it. We're doing well. Trends are, are in the right direction. Now it's inning two. <laughs> and it's a nine inning game and we got a fastball pitcher and we got to deal with that okay i don't mean fastball like the inning like like it's going to go fast i mean it's going to be hard exactly salim virus detection does not equal infection couldn't have said it better uh brian gargano should so would spraying objects with lysol disinfect yeah lysol is a disinfectant um like i said remember you know, I use a system in my house of mail and groceries where I put them in a one place all the time. I never put them near food or food preparation. And I deal with my mail. I deal with packages. And then I clean the area, wash my hands. <coughs> Excuse me. So, and then wipe down the counter. Uh, Dana Green, not to get too political, but do you watch the press conferences from the White House? <laughs> I don't, but oftentimes... Um, someone else in my household does and so i have to listen <laughs> if so can you record yourself watching to show us all i imagine many people who rely on data and science cringe when listening yeah it's it's you know um there there are uh, I, I i don't have much words to really talk about this it's 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 heartening in many ways okay Yeah, actually, if if we were listening, what you would hear me is 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 um just keep I, I keep saying why why are we doing this? Okay, anyway, I won't I won't get into it. Uh, Ahmad Flager, thanks so much. Oh man, it's uh it's my pleasure, and it is a uh, it's great to see you. Uh, um, I know I know you. I think back from McKnight days. So 30 years, man, 30 years at least. That's a long time. Uh, so it's really great seeing you. And uh, let's see. Have you touched on the antimalarial drug, hydroxychloroquine? Uh, we have. Um, not much has changed through some of these other episodes. You know, there just needs to be more data. You know, if you're sick and, you know, everyone's getting hydroxychloroquine now in hospitals. So if you're hospitalized, you're getting hydroxychloroquine if they have it. Um, people are still dying on it. Some people are living, whether it's a hydroxychloroquine or not. Um, we just don't know right now. There's not enough data. There's some data that supports it. There's some data that supports side effects. There's a lot of articles out there. Go to this Aleem Reze, uh, Rebel EM. Go to his uh, go to his Twitter feed, his website, uh, Rebel EM. I think it's rebelem.com. Pretty sure it is. He has tons of stuff on there. And... Um, and uh and you you could get some more info there we just don't, don't okay <clears throat> yeah the dome becca swanson the geodesic dome uh what was his name uh, buckminster fuller everyone remembers that i'm not flagger 30 years you, you guys can have a watch party on zoom yeah okay uh, Mich uh michael michael Michael, yeah. How risky is it to order food from places like Uber Eats and Postmates? We cover this a lot on some of the uh, previous ones. This has been a theme for a while. I do it. Um, you just want to go through the proper, right, the proper measures, meaning you want to be six feet away. Just have them put the food on your doorstep, take the food in an area that is away from food preparation or anything that you could kind of cross contaminate. Take the food out. Uh, use a spatula or something like that, and then wash your hands, right? And then eat. And then eat. Okay. Uh, Salim, hydroxychloroquine not proven for COVID-19. There are some real harms that come from this medication as well. Two studies published today, that's right, of um, uh, neither showed benefit. Yeah, not a magic bullet. That's Oh, I'm having some technical issues here, um, but so so we'll we'll start moving towards towards shutting this down. Yeah, there you know there there's there's no question that hydroxychloroquine 
you know, given that it's it's being given to so many patients and so many patients are still dying, that it is far from uh, what was being touted here. Um, and, and that's what's important to just understand the underlying science. Um, sorry, I... I'm just saving my, uh, I'm doing some Wi-Fi stuff here. So that Rebel EM, thanks for posting that. Uh, hey, I urge everyone to go to this. It's going to be technical. It's going to be, it's definitely going to be technical for you guys. Uh, but I encourage you to go to it. Great site. And I'm going to start wrapping up here. Uh, Brian Gargano, is it feasible at this point to reopen things by July 1? There's no date. We, we don't have a date. Reopening means that we're doing both at the same time, right? There's not just reopen, we run out and, you know, dance in the streets. And you guys know that. I'm not, I'm not belittling that point, but it, there needs to be a plan, okay? There needs to be uh, systems in place for this. So there needs to be testing. There needs to be um, some surveillance. There needs to be sy just systems, basic public health systems to be able to respond and limit the spread uh, of infectivity. Right? So if we find an infection, we need to limit that. And I think the technical parts of this are better now. I think I fixed it. Okay, fishing is social distancing, maybe camping. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think you could do those things uh, for sure. I I'm all for that. Okay, let's wrap it up. That was an hour and 15 minutes. This was awesome. You guys asked great questions. Hopefully this was useful uh, for everyone out there. Um, let me check my calendar. And let's see if we could do this next Tuesday as well. Let's see. It'll be the 21st. I got nothing going on. <laughs> so I should be able to do this. I'll be on. Think of your questions. Watch the news. Michael Osterholm. Follow Michael Osterholm. He is unbelievable. And um, he's, he's my favorite. Hands down my favorite out there. And there's a lot of people. I created, if you go to Twitter, Rush Review, um, at Rush Review, or just type in Adam Rush, I started a list. I think I made a public of just reliable COVID uh, people that I follow on COVID. It's a very small list. There's really, really like three people on it right now. There's people who probably have better uh, better lists out there. Um, I should probably add. That. It's not. I don't add the technical people to it though. Like for example, don't get upset. Salim's on it, but you should go to his site simply because I read the article separately. The ones I do on Twitter are just like what's happening in the world of um, like what's the public hearing. And I want to know that stuff. I want to know kind of what's coming out that way. Okay, guys. So I know. Yeah, my dad just said uh, Michael Osterholm was on TV last night. The MSNBC interview of him was really good. The problem with these interviews is they don't last long enough. So what I encourage you to do is he has a podcast he does through his institute in Minnesota. It's like the Center for Infectious Disease. So, so good, guys. Th that's where just one, if you spend one hour listening to Michael Osterholm, that is 20 hours that you don't have to listen to uh, the, the nonsense in other places, okay? Think about that. You want a good 80-20 principle right now? Um, listen to one hour of Michael Osterholm, two hours of Michael Osterholm, and it, it will answer 80% of your questions, okay? That is powerful. All right, he is reliable. All right, guys, really great seeing you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. And just remember this, that just because we're on a uh, shelter in place or we're physically distanced doesn't mean you can't interact with people, whether it's through Zoom, a phone call, letter, letter writing, uh, meeting in the street, staying apart, uh, reach out, video conference people, talk to people, excuse me, and and be creative, do things you weren't normally doing, keep a journal, write down your thoughts, read more. All of these things are healthy. Stay active, stay fit, and, um, and do this day by day, but have long-term thinking here, okay? Long-term thinking, and, uh, and, and we, will, we will get by. We will, all, we, will all, we will all do this. All right, guys, have a great one. Stay safe. Salim, thank you, and uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. Um, hopefully with some, some more good information. Talk to you guys later. Ciao.